can only imagine. And if you don't know the words, it's all about I can only imagine what heaven's going to be like, essentially. I want to try and fill in just a little bit this morning on that subject. So would you stand with me for the last time? We will, well, hopefully not the last time ever, but in this series, <laughs> read together from Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 28. Now about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake... They saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone and they kept silence and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's pray together. Father, we lift up to you our thanksgiving for this wonderful passage and for the uh, many awesome truths that it conveys. We pray that you will guide us in our thoughts this morning as we attempt to pull some more information out of this that teaches us a little bit about what it would be like to be in your presence. We thank you for the honor of belonging to you. I want to pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who do not have the privileges we have, as Scott already mentioned this morning, to come freely without fear of penalty or persecution. So many places, it seems like it's worse than ever. And so we want to hold them up, be with our missionaries, families like the Losis, as they, uh, at least part of the family now, is going to go back for, for a brief time to the place where they've been ministering. We pray that you will give them wisdom and strength. The Lord, that you'll open doors and close doors as you see fit. I know they're worried about visas, in the next year, about a year from now. And we pray that you will continue to open that door as they continue to translate your word and make it available to these people who would not have it otherwise. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings we enjoy. Help us to be fully accountable, to take advantage of them in ministry. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And if you haven't already, please do turn to Luke chapter 9. You know, how would you like to pick up the newspaper one day and then and read there that you died the day before? Uh, well, that's what happened to Mark Twain in 1897. He had a cousin who had been seriously ill in London, and somebody got it all mixed up at the newspaper. And they had the obituary all ready to go, and so they ran with it. And uh, he was sitting there reading his own obituary. That's uh, what prompted the famous phrase from him, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Well, that same phrase could certainly be equally applied to anyone, to anyone who is in Christ. Gone here one of these days, we all will be, but more alive than ever over there. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. And God wants that hope, hope in the biblical sense, a certainty that just hasn't been realized yet. God wants that hope to inform our whole life here. That's why he continually is urging us, invest there, not here. Make sure that the majority of what you're doing, the majority of your attention is focused there. Sure, we have to live here. There are important things that have to be done here, but how to put them in the context of eternity is what God is urging us at all times. But because we have a lot of misconceptions about what comes next, about what this afterlife is about, 
we sometimes are very tempted to just hold on very tightly to now. That's our, that's our default mode to have what we have now. But our text can really help us on this, I think. You know, we've, we've already seen this. We've studied it enough to know that the main point of this passage, the main message is that the death of Christ, which he has been continually talking about with his disciples and trying to bring home to them, set their expectations right, that his death is not incompatible with the coming of his kingdom, which is, of course, the thing that they have been expecting of the Messiah. Not only are they not incompatible, but in fact, the death is absolutely critical, crucial, to making sure that the kingdom actually happens. Moses and Elijah, who are here on this mountaintop, would not be able to be in heaven unless the death of Christ occurs, nor could any of us. That's the main message. But peripherally, because this is a preview of the kingdom of God, we can see some certain kingdom conditions. Now, this is not a full exposure. It's not even a full, everything that the Bible teaches us about the kingdom of God and about heaven, but we see certain portents of the preview that help us understand what kingdom conditions are like. And we started to look at that last week in terms of some questions we were asking. The first question being, is there an afterlife? And we said, well, the Bible is very clear on that. There sit Moses and Elijah pr providing living, breathing proof. It's not just something that the Bible states. It's something that has been seen. And these men who are eyewitnesses have reported that for us. The second thing we looked at was, what's the best thing about the kingdom? And the answer to that was far and away, Jesus. He's the central point of everything, right? He's the key to entrance. Jesus is the one around whom everything will revolve in the kingdom. He lights the whole universe. As we get into kingdom times, Jesus is the one around whom everything revolves. He's the central point. But now some questions today that deal with, well, what about us? What will it be like for us? And the first question that we'll ask is, well, what will we be like? Because this preview gives us some insight into that. It shows us, first of all, that we're going to be a lot like we are now. Here stand Moses and Elijah, already citizens of the kingdom. And what are they doing? Well, they're talking. They're standing. They're reasoning. They're doing a lot of the same things that we do, right? They display all the characteristics of body and mind that we take for granted. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says this. It says, but our citizenship as believers, our citizenship is in heaven. We're no longer citizens of this earth, we're citizens of heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself, including our physical bodies. So in heaven, we will have a body. It will be a transformed body, as Paul tells us there. It will be like, and yet not like, the one that we have now. The name that Paul gives us partly gives us some insight of that. Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, he calls it a spiritual body. He says, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now to us, that's an oxymoron, right? You're either a spirit or you're a body, but you can't be both at the same time. But Paul says, no, this is going to be a body that can rightfully be called a spiritual body. It's something different, something different than we know now, and yet much like what we know now. So this spiritual body is what we will have. So the question becomes, well, what is a spiritual body like? Never, never seen one of those. Well, we get an answer for that pretty easily. In fact, Philippians 3, verse 21, the verse I just read, gives us the first hint when it says it's going to be like his glorious body, meaning Christ's glorious body, what do we know about that? Well, that's the body that Jesus had 
post-resurrection, after his resurrection, right? And guess what? Some people saw that. And so we can get some insight into what our spiritual body will be like. Paul calls it that same title in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So what he's saying is essentially, hey, the body of Christ is kind of the prototype. It's the model for what we will be like. So if, if we want to find out what we will be like, we need to find out a little bit about what he was like. Let's take a look at a couple passages. Let's start in Luke 24. You're already in Luke, so just turn over to the 24th chapter. This is the day of the resurrection. You'll recall that uh, Jesus has met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then he has appeared to all of his 12 apostles, except for Thomas. And that's where he is in verse 36, where we pick up Luke 24, verse 36, when he's with them right after the resurrection. It says, and they were as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. And he said to them, peace to you. That's because his appearance wasn't exactly peaceful to them at the moment, appearing out of nowhere. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. So he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. I mean, just think of all the things we learned just in that one short two or three verses about the spiritual body that we will have. It's a body that can talk. It's a body that can walk. It's a body that has an appearance. It can be seen. It can be touched. It can sense it, the needs of others. It can hear. It's composed of flesh and bones, even though it's called a spiritual body. It's a lot like then our present body, right? We can relate to just about everything that we see there. What that means, beloved, I mean, you know, to put it in sort of crude terms, I mean, we're not, we're not going to spend eternity like Casper the ghost or something, right? Where you, where you reach out to touch and your hand goes right through or whatever. If I remember right, it's been a long time since I saw Casper, but it seems like that was the way. Not, it's not going to be that way. We're going to have substance. We're going to have self-consciousness. This is, by the way, totally opposite of what Eastern thought and Eastern religions teach, which teach that we all, in nirvana, we lose all sense of self-conscious. Our, our, our whole sense of identity becomes one with all the rest of the world and the universe, and there is no separate sense of identity. The Bible is just exactly the opposite. We'll have an identity. We will have self-consciousness. We will be able to reason. We will have substance. Now, I don't know about you, I like that. It's what I am. I can relate to that. But Jesus isn't done. Look at, let's go on here in, in Luke 24. Look at verse 40. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved, but now for joy, you know, in other words, this is just too good to be true, it's starting to pop into, into their mind. They were marveling. He said to them, have you any thing to eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate before them. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? He ate before them. Why did he do that? To demonstrate once again the nature of his body and the nature of the reality of who he was. Jesus hungry at this point? I don't think that was the main issue at all. He's trying to convince them that he's not a spirit, that he's flesh and blood and bone, and that he is a living being. Now, this shows us another thing about a spiritual body, right? It apparently eats. I'm sure some of you guys are going, yes! And you know, here we are, yes. Physical, spirit, the spiritual body will be able to eat. In fact, the Bible talks a lot about this. A lot about eating in the kingdom. You know, God is, 
I, I, he put appetites in us and he kind of understands what it takes to satisfy those. So here's a few passages. Let me just read them for you. Matthew 26, verse 29. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is at the Last Supper, Jesus is saying this. In Luke's account, he mentions eating as well. He says, he says later that evening, Jesus told his disciples in Luke 22, verse 28, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. I take it literally, beloved. Revelation 2.7, to those who conquer, those are believers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We're gonna eat from the tree of life. I, are you starting to like spiritual bodies? This is a good thing that God has created for us and is creating for us. They sh share many of the same physical and emotional and, and spiritual and mental characteristics of the bodies that we inhabit now. But there are differences as well. There are differences as well. Turn over with me to John, if you're in Acts, still John chapter 20. John 20. And we can see one of these differences in verse 26. John 20, verse 26. It says eight days later. This is after his resurrection. Eight days after his resurrection, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Can you appear through walls and uh, lock doors? Can't do that, can we? And yet in his new spiritual body, Jesus could somehow do that. Turn with me a little further to Acts chapter one and verse nine. Acts one and verse nine. It says, and this is, this is as he's talking with his disciples about seven weeks after all of this says, and when he had said these things, they were asking him, is the kingdom gonna come now? Are you gonna do it now? Jesus is saying, not for you to know the time. And when he had said these things, as they were looking up, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. So a spectacular ascension is the last glimpse of the physical Christ that we have here on earth. And he entered a sphere that we can't enter in this life, let alone survive. He's going back to be with the Father. It tells us elsewhere that he went to be, to ascended to the right hand of the Father. He went back to heaven from which he had come. Now, we don't know exactly where or what heaven is. It's called by different names in the Bible, one of those being the New Jerusalem. Hebrews 13, verse 14, it says, for we have no lasting city here on earth, but we seek the city that is to come. That's the place where Jesus went. And it's the place where he's preparing rooms for those who are believers. According to Revelation 2 and verse 12, the new Jerusalem, when it's created, will come down to earth at a certain point in time. And as our bodies have substance, I think it's fair to assume that that city will have substance as well. Now, where exactly is heaven? You know, the best, in one sense, we, we, we see indications like the ascension that heaven is in some way up. That makes sense. It'd be hard for it to be down, I suppose. But let me suggest something, and this is speculation. This is not biblical, but I just wanna, I just wanna throw this out for your consideration. Perhaps heaven is a place that occupies even another dimension, if you will, but isn't that far away from a, if, you would, if, if I can use this term, from a physical standpoint. You know, we live in three dimensions, right? Physics tells us that, our scientific study tells us that, unless some people throw in 
time as a fourth dimension, but we live in three dimensions. But physicists these days, who are into string theory and some of the other exotic theories that they devise, tell us that there must be at least, they believe there are at least 10 dimensions out there. 10 dimensions that could be occupied, most of which, of course, we have no access to. Here's my question. Is it possible that a spiritual body will actually provide access to heaven which occupies some dimension out there that we can't get to now in the body that we occupy physically? Is that possible? Here's one thing we do know from the Bible. We know that angels occupy basically the same space we do, but in some dimensions where we don't see them unless they choose, unless God chooses to let them be seen, right? Bible talks about heaven, about angels coming back and forth to heaven. In fact, in Daniel 10, Daniel prays a prayer and he's three weeks waiting for an answer and an angel finally shows up on his doorstep and says, oh, by the way, as soon as you prayed, I was sent and I would have been here three weeks ago, but I was prevented by some demonic activity from coming ahead to call for reinforcements. You talk about the reality of spiritual warfare. Check Daniel 10 out. But happening in some dimension that's close by, but that we can't quite get to. I don't think it's impossible that heaven is not that far away. But I'll tell you this, whatever the case and wherever it is, the spiritual body that we will get because of our faith in Christ eventually, the time of, of the resurrection of our bodies will be one that can inhabit heaven, whatever and wherever it is. That's one of the things that's guaranteed. It's a, it's a great difference between the body that we have now and the body that we will have then. Perhaps the most startling difference of all is in one sense the most obvious. There stand Moses and Elijah, right? On the mountain of transfiguration, as we call it. 1,400 and 900 years old, respectively, and doing just fine. What does that tell us about spiritual bodies? Well, it tells us this, beloved, they last forever. John 5, 24, Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life, eternal life. There's a reason that Jesus called it eternal life. That's because it's eternal. It's forever. Spiritual bodies fit us for a life that we could never have here. Imagine, imagine the Lord giving us this wonderful body and equip us with a body that can last forever. You know, Bar uh, Barbara Walters, I saw this interview a number of years ago, shortly before John Wayne died. She was interviewing John Wayne, and she asked him a question I've always wondered about too. She said to him, you know, how is it watching your young self on the TV screen? What's it feel like to see yourself, you know, 40, 50 years ago? And here's how he answered. He said, it's, it's kind of irritating to see I was a good looking 40 year old and suddenly I can look in the mirror and I see this 71 year old. I'm not squawking, I just wanna be around for a long time. Unfortunately, he didn't have much time left when he made that statement. But the point is physical bodies don't last, but spiritual bodies are forever. Something to really look forward to. I like the fact that God is going to give us these bodies that have self-consciousness, that have a forever quality about them that have all these other qualities that we've looked at as well. So that's just a little bit, that's just a touch of what will we be like. How about another question, will we know each other? Will we know each other? People always asking that question and the answer to that is yes, yes. Very clearly demonstrated here on this mountain. Moses and Elijah somehow know Peter, James and John and they know them, everybody knows everybody, even though they're from completely different historical eras. Paul says, you remember the statement Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter. He says, he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly. 
I, I like how C.S. Lewis calls it. He says this world is, that we live in, he calls it the shadow lands. To us, it looks like the greatest reality ever. You know, we look out at the mountains on a day like yesterday and they're clear and pristine and everything looks wonderful. And, and the fact is, it's just a shadow, beloved, of what, of what reality really is. It's just, it's, just a, it's just a dim picture. That's why Paul says in, in that verse, for we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. You know, there's, there's nothing in this life that we know fully at this point in time, right? There's no person that we know fully. In fact, I'll give you a secret. We don't even know ourselves fully, right? We don't. But in the world to come, there's not going to be anything hidden. We will know as we have been known. We will know fully. We will know, you know, one of the reasons I think there's no marriage or giving in marriage in heaven, we'll know each other intimately, all of us. You know, it's one reason I think Pastors should never get discouraged. Because why? Because God is, what has he said in Philippians 1.6? I, I, the one who have started the work in you, will perfect it in the day of Christ Jesus. Listen, whatever you do with what I give you and you take out of here and you live a messy life and goof it up, you're not going to discourage me because I know one day you're going to be like Jesus Christ. I may not recognize you. and You may not recognize me. I don't know when we get that kind of perfection. But we will know as we even as we are known. Yes, we will know each other. You know, after the resurrection, Jesus was fully known after some false starts at recognition, right? Mary Magdalene was the first one to see him. And you'll remember that in the early dawn of that day, the, the uh, uh, light not being very good through tear-stained eyes, Thinking that he had been stolen, she mistook Jesus for the gardener. But you also remember that the moment he said her name, bingo, she knew exactly who he was. The two men on the road to Emmaus, or the two disciples, I think it's very possible it was Claudius and his wife, but whoever they were, when Jesus appeared to them and walked with them, they didn't recognize him immediately. Remember that? But we're told why. In Luke 24, verse 16, it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Who did that? Must have been God, right? For his own purposes, God kept them from recognizing him. But, but that very fact implies that had God not blinded their perceptions, they would have recognized him. Yes, we will know each other in heaven. John Evans was a, um, he was one of those great Presbyterian Scottish ministers from years past. He was sitting in his study one day and his wife came in and she said, John, I've been studying somewhere. And she said, I, just, I have this question. She said, will we know each other in heaven? And he, and he looked at her and he said, my dear, do you think we will be bigger fools in heaven than we are now? Of course we will know each other. We will know each other in heaven. Well, how about another question? Do people in heaven know what's happening on earth? Most of us here have loved ones who have gone on. And sometimes we wonder, how much do they know? Can they know what's going on here? To me, that question is harder to answer definitively I think there's ample evidence that they know the general outline of what's happening. It's pretty clear that Moses and Elijah were aware of what Jesus had been doing and they knew what he was about to do. They knew that better than the disciples, as a matter of fact. Now you might say, well, that's because they were on the mountain and Jesus told them and this has all been revealed to them. Maybe God even pulled them aside before he sent them there and said, here's what's going on. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us in John 8, verse 56, that Abraham also was not on the mountain, was aware of what was going on in the life of Christ. So I think at some level we can say that people in heaven know what's going on. 
Now, you could also say, well, these guys were really interested in this thing because this was a big deal. They were in heaven on credit. They knew that their sins had to be paid for if they were gonna stay there. And so naturally they were interested in what was going on, but did they know other things? Well, turn with me to Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. We'll get to the last book of the Bible here. Most of you will know that Revelation 6 through 19 is describing a yet to come seven year period of great tribulation on the earth leading to the consummation of all things when Jesus comes again. But in these chapters, we have evidence of all the mostly pretty horrible things that are gonna be going on on earth. And people who name the name of Christ during that period of time of whom there will be many, many of them will be martyred. So martyrdom will be at the beginning of the church, it'll be at the end of the church, it's in the middle of the church. I look at chapter six, Revelation six, beginning at verse nine. It says, when he, this is Christ, opened the fifth seal, as John is seeing this vision, Christ is opening seals that reveal things that are gonna happen in the future. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Do you see what that verse implies? It implies that these who are now in heaven are aware of what's going on during this time of great trouble on earth. They're crying out for revenge for themselves and for others who have been martyred. Now the answer that they're given in this passage, if you go on, they're given white robes and they're basically told to wait on God's time till the number of martyrs is made complete. But they know, the point is they know that God has not yet judged the earth. They know that this consummation hasn't occurred yet. So they know something of what's going on on earth. The, Luke 15 verse 10, we'll get there in a few weeks, tells us that the angels in heaven know when someone on earth has come to faith in Christ. So I think we can say, at least in general terms, people in heaven know what's going on here on earth. Do they know absolutely everything? Can they see? I don't personally know of anything in the Bible that tells us one way or the other on that, but I think they generally know what's happening. They generally know what's happening. Another question, what other conditions apply? What other conditions apply that we could read out of this passage back in Luke 9. One of the great implications that stems from the transfiguration is that we know that they are there discussing what Jesus is about to accomplish in Jerusalem. His exodus, and we looked at that, what is that mean, his departure or his exodus? We said that it's the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. It's the culmination of centuries of promise that there's coming a redeemer who will deal with the sin problem that mankind has had forever. So starting in Genesis 3.15 forward, we keep getting these, these promises and these pictures of a coming redeemer. And Jesus is now going to do that. His death will finally and completely deal with sin. So one thing we know for sure is that there will be no sin in the kingdom of God, there'll be no sin in heaven. And in sin's absence, perfection will reign because sin is the cause of every bad thing that we run into. Heaven is a reversal of the fall, is another way to look at it. It's going back to the conditions that applied before the fall happened in the Garden of Eden, the perfection that existed there. And so there will be harmony between, for example, there'll be harmony between man and nature. Between man and nature. Paul says in Romans 8, beginning in verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption 
and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Listen, beloved, everything that seems wrong in the world of nature is a result of the fall. I mean, you want to talk about all the issues, even in our own lives, but in the lives of other people. You know, we, I was reading this week, C.S. Lewis, you know, before he was a Christian, was watching all these animals, these ants in some ant pile somewhere and was near the water and they were all getting drowned and he thought how awful that these animals are getting destroyed and what a horrible thing that was. And he came to realize when he came to faith in Christ, oh, that's part of the fall. Things happen as a result of the fall. We have broken natures as a result of the fall. We all have broken natures. We all have fallenness. Some of us have emotional issues. Some of us have uh, that, that go on and, and, and it just seems like we can't quite get on top of them. And, and some of us have addictions and some of us have, we have people who have homosexuality. Where did it come from? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aberration that was caused by the fall. All of nature is messed up because of the fall. And if you don't realize that, you'll be wondering, well, where did all this come from? And what will correct it? The coming kingdom of God will correct it. It's the only thing that will correct it because he's dealt with this issue. Give you another picture of it. Isaiah chapter 11. Let me read it for the sake of time. Isaiah 11, beginning in verse six. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. You wouldn't do that today, would you? The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together and the little child shall lead them. Send your kids out to play with the lions today. You gonna do that? I don't think so. But you will then. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw with the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put its hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Is that good? That's what we have to look forward to. But in sin's absence, it's not just nature that will be fixed. We will also. We will be changed. It's the, it's, the, it's, it's the culmination of the new creation that actually starts inside in this life that gets its fullest expression later when the kingdom itself gets its fullest expression. We will be changed. No more aging. No more fear. No more sorrow. No more guilt. No more pain, no, no more failure, no more death. Can't wait, can you? That's what it's going to be like. Jesse read it this morning in Revelation 21 4. He, God, shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine God wiping away your tears? Death shall be no more, neither shall there be any mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have all passed away. We will be physically, emotionally, spiritually perfect. I think it's fair to say we will have a youthful appearance in our spiritual body, very much like somebody would at the prime of life. I take it from the fact that Adam was created not as a baby, but as a full-grown, mature man, and then he lived for another 930 years. So I assume he must have been kind of looked like a 25 or 30-year-old, something like that. That's who we'll be. Clouded minds will be cleared. Wow. Johnny Erickson Tata, most of you are aware of Johnny. She has a radio show, has been a prominent author. She was paralyzed in a swimming accident in 1967 at the age of 16. She's still with us. I think it's fair to say she's probably looking forward to heaven even more than most of us. She says this, she says, somewhere in my broken, paralyzed body is the seed of what I shall become. The paralysis makes what I am to become all the more grand. When you contrast atrophied, useless legs against splendorous, resurrected legs, if there are any mirrors in heaven, and why not, 
The image I'll see will be unmistakably Johnny, although a much better, brighter Johnny. Randy Alcorn in his book, Heaven, if you haven't read it, you need to read it. He says this, inside your body, even if it is failing, is the blueprint for your resurrection body. You may not be satisfied with your current body or mind, but you'll be thrilled with your resurrection upgrades. I'm ready for that, are you? It'll be great. It'll be great. Heaven's gonna be great. So how should, this, how should this affect us now? Let's ask that question. Jesus answers that one in Matthew 13. Some of you are familiar with this. this these are a bunch of parables. We call them kingdom parables. And one of them goes like this. Matthew 13 and verse 44. He says, he says the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So, so your first question might be, well, why does he cover it up? If he finds the treasure, he's digging away, I don't know, getting weeds out of somebody's garden or something, and he's digging away, and man, he runs into this cache of gold. It's unbelievable, he can't believe it. So he covers it up. The reason he covers it up, because the law in those days said that anything found on your property is yours. So what does he do? He covers it up and he runs and he sells everything he's got. You know, there goes the Cadillac, the wife's jewelry, you know, the house, everything is gone. He sells it all. So he can go buy the field because he knows that what's in that field is so much more precious than anything that he had. And what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, listen, the treasure of the kingdom of God is worth way more than anything you have in this life. So hold it loosely. Invest in eternity. That's what he's saying. The point is that God's kingdom is just far greater than anything. Listen, beloved, sometimes we get the wrong idea about Christ. When Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, to us that sounds like, whoa, it's a living death. And it is, but it's not it's not a call to martyrdom. It's not a call to something bad. It's a call to something infinitely better than anything we could ever have if we're trying to hang on to this life, if we're trying to live the next 80 years the way we think it ought to be lived. He's not asking us to give up personal ambition and you know childhood dreams and worldly pleasures for nothing. Jesus isn't like that. The treasure of eternity with him is worth far more than anything we can have here. He's not saying give it all up so that, you know, at the end of the year they can pin a medal on you that says 2014 selfless award winner. That's not the point. He's saying, listen, whatever you have to do to make me number one in your life, whatever you have to give up, whatever you have to let go of because you want it more than me, because you love it more than me, because you idolize it, give it up, sell it to get the kingdom. Whatever you do, don't miss that. That's the message. So for unbelievers, the message is really clear. Heaven is worth more than you will ever find in this life. Take the challenge to be a follower of Christ at the cost of death to self because the life you get will be worth way more. How about for believers? What does all this mean to us? Well, basically for believers, it means to live like who we are. Live like who we are. Be the Christians that we are. Paul says in Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit we are the children of God. And if children, now listen to this, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And what has Christ inherited? What did God give him? Based on Ephesians 1 and other passages, he gave him the whole universe. He's put all things under his feet. 
Jesus has inherited the whole universe. So what are we doing trying to hang on to some little pittance of earthly inheritance when in the, at the end we're, we're co-heirs of everything? How foolish. We're like, we're like Golem, you know, and the Lord of the Rings hanging on for dear life to his precious, to the ring. Not, not aware of the hideous monster that he's becoming in the process. That's what we are. And we selfishly hang on to the things of this life. He's saying, sell it all and get Jesus. Your inheritance in Christ is stupendous, so live like it. Act like it. Let it go. Let me close with this. It's a wonderful passage from the Narnia Chronicles. C.S. Lewis near the end after he's been showing the struggle of life and he's been showing the difference between the shadow lands of Narnia and the reality of heaven. He ends this way. He says, and as Aslan, remember the great lion representing Christ, and as Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that had begun to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Beloved, for us, this life is one of two things. It's either the beginning of the end, an end compromise or comprised of an eternity without Christ, or this life is the end of the beginning and all the best is yet to come. Choose Christ. Choose Christ. For those who are in Christ, their death will be greatly exaggerated because the moment they die, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's why Jesus could say, for those who are in me, there is no death. The moment you die, you're alive in him. You won't even, somebody says, you won't even be dead long enough to know you're dead. I think the Bible's answer is you won't even be dead. How do you like that? But you gotta be in Christ. Let's pray. Father, what wonderful promises and what hope and what certainty, Lord, what joy wells up in our hearts as we consider what is ahead for us. Lord, we, we, we don't wanna, we can't abandon this life. It's not like you're asking us to go live in a monastery somewhere. In fact, you're asking us, you're asking us to represent this wonderful story to the world in which we live. Some will get it, some won't, but the idea is for us to represent you in all of your glory, in all of your majesty, and to anticipate what's gonna come in a way that informs and justifies and motivates the way we live now. Thank you for the wonderful promises. Thank you for the, for the hope that it brings to our hearts. Help us to take it with us and let it be forever a part of who we are, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.